Praise God, for He is good and His mercy and loving kindness endure forever, forever. Precious Holy Spirit, we just welcome you right now to help us. We thank you for the perfect integrity of our Father God's Word that gives us such great confidence as we talk about and discuss heaven. Father, we thank you right now for the gift of your precious Holy Spirit, for your Son, Jesus, and we just ask that you breathe upon the Word, and Lord, may it find its mark in our heart that our lives will never be the same again. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Talking about heaven. We're talking about heaven. That's good news. Do you ever wonder about eternity? Life after this life? Where this world is going? Where your life is going? Where your family is going? The big questions, right? Dennis Miller, the comedian, he once said, It's ironic that in our culture, everyone's biggest complaint is about not having enough time. Yet nothing terrifies us more than the thought of eternity. And then that other great philosopher, Charlie Brown, the cartoon character, he said this, sometimes I lay awake at night and ask, why me? Why me? Then a voice answers, nothing personal. Your name just happened to come up. (laughs) In a way, this is us trying to laugh off mortality, the big questions, what we're afraid of. But the answer is, my friend, yes, Heaven is real. Good news. Yes, heaven is real. And because of Jesus, we can have heaven as our eternal home, our eternal destination. You know, many people live with this randomized view of life and all the things that just seem to happen. Life just seems random. If you were going on a trip without clear destination, a GPS, a map, or a compass, don't you think the whole experience would be just rather random? And yet most of humanity goes, uh, goes at life with this accidental approach. Even God said this. He said, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Knowledge of what? Knowledge of where we're going, who we're going with, what the plan is. You know, it's troubling to even hear a professing believer admit to owning a life philosophy that's arbitrary. The word random means this. It means without definite aim, without direction, without rule. You know, so many people live life like that without direction or rule. You know you appear to be an intentional person just by having a decent day-to-day plan. Or you can be really impressive with a five- to ten-year plan. But what if life, listen to me, what if life is more than what we see? Because it really is. What if life is more than just the next 20 or 30 years? What if life goes beyond what you see or feel? Imagine a canvas with me. Imagine that canvas being your life, a four by four, quite a large canvas, and it's your life. And you're just looking at the tiniest, tiniest fraction of that canvas. You see a fraction of the color. You see only the tiniest, tiniest fraction of that big picture. No wonder life seems random if that's your perspective. You've got no aim. You've got no direction. You do have got, you have got social media, don't you? You've got Google Maps, you've got Twitter, but no life direction. It's funny, a wise person once said this. He said, I don't know if Facebook has ever made the lame to walk, but it has beyond all doubt enabled the dumb to speak. <laughs> we have become universally ignorant of life, eternity, but woke to misdirection and offense. Something's got to change. Consider this. Sailors for many centuries accurately navigated their course across nautical miles of ocean and sea using their position relative to the sun and relative to the stars as a guide. These sailors would use, think about this, stars that were 75 to 100 light years away. Do you know what a light year is? It's 5.88 trillion miles. So think about it. They would use a star that was almost 600 trillion miles away to help guide them across open waters on planet Earth. Sailors use stars as a fixed point. You need a fixed point to live your life. Now, Jesus is the way and heaven is a fixed point. 
like an eternal North Star, if you will. Jesus is the way to the Father, but where is that? You see, the Father is in heaven. We pray, our Father who art in heaven. Isn't that what we pray? And yet it escapes us. We do the exact opposite in this life. We use the instincts and morality of a split pop culture second to try and find authentic hope, peace, and purpose. Oh, my dear friend, that's like trying to squeeze the universe into a grain of sand. True hope is a measurement of heaven, eternal life. How can you have joy, peace, trying to squeeze immortality into a grain of sand? That's futility. Even a child knows that. We need our eyes of understanding and enlightened to real hope. Yes, there is a king of heaven. There is a king of eternity. Jesus said he would prepare a place for us. My friend, heaven is real. And don't believe the ignorant religious views of a fake heaven. It is not an eternal church service or a 24-hour-a-day religious conference. It's not monks chanting on clouds. Ignorant beliefs about the real heaven are dangerous because they misrepresent the truth, God's truth, and therefore they misrepresent God's character, His goodness, His mercy, His extreme love, His ability to prepare an eternal life for you and me. C.S. Lewis, the great author and theologian, he said this. He said, aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. He's right. You see, it's not heaven at the expense of earth. It's heaven so we can exercise God's will on earth as it is in heaven. We're called to pray God's perfect will on earth but it's a measurement that comes from heaven. Over the past century, humanity has progressed in an amazing way with technology and advancement and accomplishment. But as we've increased in stuff and inventions, we've decreased in our doctrine of heaven. As we've decreased in our doctrine of heaven, our immorality has thrived and so has our hopelessness. Can you see this? There's a direct correlation between losing sight of heaven and becoming more immoral and astonished that we're so hopelessly at drift in life. Our culture, even North American Christianity, has in great part morphed the true doctrine of heaven into this hybrid of entertainment and fairy tale byproduct. And nobody even wants it. Nobody wants it. Lies and compromise are weak powerless, and they make room for immorality at the expense of real hope, real joy, living effective now here on earth. Listen to Philippians 3, 17 through 20. Brothers and sisters, together follow my example and observe those who live by the pattern we gave you. For there are many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, who live as enemies of the cross of Christ, rejecting and opposing his way of salvation, whose fate is destruction, whose God is their belly, their worldly appetite, their sensuality, their vanity, and whose glory is in their shame, who focus their mind on earthly and temporal things. But, oh, verse 20, but we are different because... Our citizenship is in heaven. And why is that? Because of Jesus, because of the work of Jesus on the cross. That's why we should never, ever become an enemy of the cross or despise his cross or take it for granted. So a couple of things we see here in this passage. Number one, God tells us that there is a pattern to live by. There's directions for his family on earth. Imagine that. Number two, there are real enemies of the cross of Christ who reject God's way. You see, God's way is to heaven, but it's through the cross, Jesus' cross. Number three, vanity and a focus on earthly things are misdirection that lead to destruction. 
The enemy wants to destroy your life. And he uses this misfocus, this misdirected focus on earthly things instead of having that heavenly North Star. And number four, you are different. In Christ Jesus, you're different. And how does that apply here on earth? Because your citizenship, your true citizenship is in heaven. Yes, heaven is real. You know, our culture likes to dumb down heaven to a joke, a punchline, but never let go of the reality of a real heaven that is God's throne. Jim Gaffigan, the comedian, and I really like him. He said this, he said, West Virginia has the state slogan, almost heaven, West Virginia. So then he asked the question, so does that mean when I die, I'm going to a place just a little bit better than West Virginia? My friend, no. See, that's not good enough. But that's the truth in our entertainment and in our constant joking about it. We really have dumbed down the reality of heaven. And the problem is that doesn't help when we're facing crisis in life and facing goodbyes. We've taken our eyes off of the truth with a capital T that can be our life compass. And we've traded it for fluffy cloud doctrine. You want the real thing. We all do. I love what Billy Graham said one time. He said, I'm not going to heaven because I've preached to great crowds or read the Bible many times. I'm going to heaven just like the thief on the cross who said in that last moment, Lord, remember me. Oh, it's all about Jesus. Our way into eternity is all about Jesus. It doesn't matter if you're Billy Graham or the thief that was on the cross. Bowing before Jesus will lift you up and exalt you to the realms of heaven. And it's beautiful. The doctrine of God's heaven puts goodbye into a victorious perspective. You know, in life, there's goodbyes. From the time we're born into this world, it doesn't take very long for our minds to be forced to deal with a life goodbye. You know what I'm talking about. Talking about mortality, a loved one passing away. We all have to deal with this reality and often the challenge begins at a young age when a family member or a person of great importance, influence, someone dear to us leaves this world. It started happening to me when I was just a little boy, preschool. Dealing with grief and sorrow is not an old age thing. It's not a senior citizen thing. It's an everybody thing. It's every family. Everybody on planet earth has to deal with these goodbyes. I've personally dealt with this pain, Pam and I, with this pain and sorrow in so many ways, so many times as a pastor standing in the hospital, standing by um, people that have seen their loved ones, their children go to heaven and seen their parents go to heaven. I know what this is about. Death can be devastating if, listen to me, if you do not have the truth regarding God the Father's heaven. Paul the Apostle, he wrote this by direction and influence under the Holy Spirit. He said this in Philippians chapter 1, verses 21, 23, and 24. Oh, this is beautiful. He says, for to me... To live is Christ. He's my source of joy, my reason to live. And to die is gain. What? I got to read that again. And to what? And to die is gain, for I will be with Christ in eternity. But I am hard pressed between the two. You've got to be kidding me. He said, I'm hard pressed between the two. I have the desire to leave this world and be with Christ, for that is far, far better Yet to remain in my body is more necessary and essential for your sake. Oh my goodness. Here's a guy that's got the love of God in his heart. He's saying, I want to be in heaven with Jesus. It's far, far better. But right now I need to be with you. It's more profitable for you that I'm here to help you and guide you and, and make sure that you understand where the North Star is, talking about the spiritual North Star of heaven and that Jesus is the way. This guy's compass is working. He's got purpose and passion on earth, but he also knows that dying is not dying. Did you hear me? Dying is not dying, but just the beginning to live with Jesus in heaven. Yes, heaven is real. Leaving this world is far, far better, Paul says. The, the Holy Spirit is persuading him, telling him that th leaving this world is far, far better. And if you don't know that, you live on earth weak and fragile. 
susceptible. If you do not have a hope beyond this life, a real hope, not a wishful thinking hope or a Las Vegas, come on, cloud number nine, false kind of hope, my friend, you're in trouble. You're doomed to live a fearful, catastrophic-based, grief and sorrow-rooted life. You see, it's not life compliant. You weren't made for such a ridiculous existence. That's why so many pursue drugs, the party life, radical response living, or, or lose themselves in their career and materialistic pursuits or, or some kind of um, cult or boxed up God type religion. Look, the number one cause of depression is a lack of clearly defined long-term goals. Heaven is God's reward. You need, you must have a yes, heaven is real kind of hope, kind of goal. The only way to have that yes, heaven is real hope and goal is to know the king of heaven, the king of kings, the Lord of glory, Jesus. It's so important. That's why we even put a button on our website that's just Jesus because his saving power, his protocol is for eternal life. So life Life can't be just, well, I, I, I think heaven's probably better than hell, so if I had to pick one, come on. If we allow this passive view of eternity, surely our hearts will break at every goodbye, at every funeral. Then there are those who opt out of living life here on earth with an impact because they're so focused on being raptured any second. You see, this is called spiritual escapism, and it's a sin. It's throwing away priceless stewardship opportunities as Christ's ambassador to live here on earth, to represent him here on earth. We got to live eternity starting right now. Don't be ineffective today because you lack vision of heaven. Remember what Jesus taught us to pray? Your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. So maybe we don't talk heaven because we don't want to. We all know we don't want to go to hell, but do we really know that we want to go to God's heaven? You see, we should want to live this life because God has energized us with his purpose, his plans. But my friend, don't we betray our ignorance of God's excellent heaven plans for us when we think this life is far better than the glory to come? God always works from glory to glory to glory. God is light and he's always moving at the speed of life. He's, he's never stopped working, not stopped creating. If you think this is beautiful, you have no idea what God has in store for you. Philippians 1 verse 23 again, Paul's letter by the unction of the Holy Spirit. He said, I desire to leave this world and be with Christ for that is far far better. And we're talking about a guy that actually had a vision of heaven. He was itching to get out of here. Do you live with a sense of what's coming is far, far better? Where my grandfather is now is far, far better. Where my dear son is right now is far, far better. Where my mom is, is far, far better. You see, you cannot live that hope if you have nothing to anchor your faith to, hope needs a bona fide North Star called truth. Jesus is king, but of what? Jesus rules eternity, but from where? If you keep thinking pop culture made for TV Hollywood answers, you got nothing. You got fluffy nothing. You cannot run this race of life without a definitive finish line. What's yours? Is it fame? Is it money? Because you see, nobody arrives at the end of this life lying in a bed with just minutes, minutes of breath left them and going, if only I had more money. Nobody does that. Nobody's lying at the end of life with just minutes to go, going, if only, if only I was more famous. If only I had been better looking and had, had more opportunity. Nobody says that. No. A thousand times, no. Jesus is talking in John 14 to his disciples. I want to read you verses 1 and 2. And here Jesus is talking to the, his discouraged, hopeless disciples. Think about it. They're right there with Jesus, but they're without a north star, so to speak. 
Jesus says this, do not let your hearts be troubled, distressed, agitated. Oh, is this speaking to you? Jesus said, you believe in and adhere to and trust in and rely on God. Believe in and adhere to and trust in and rely also on me. Verse 2, in my Father's house there are many dwelling places, homes. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I am going away to prepare a place for you. <laughs> Praise God. The King of all kings, the King of eternity has left this earth to prepare a place for you. We're moving. We're moving from glory to glory. Aren't you even slightly intrigued? It's an eternal reward. But we've got to be delivered of all this stupid and ignorant false indoctrination that we've absorbed about heaven that's not Bible. Non-Bible talk about heaven is weak. It's discouraging. It's unattractive. It's misleading and it's joy stealing. And it's definitely, definitely no fun. C.S. Lewis, again, he said this. He said, joy is the serious business of heaven. Oh, I like that. Martin Luther, the great theologian and reformer, he said this. He said, if the earth is fit for laughter, then surely heaven is filled with it. Heaven is the birthplace of laughter. I believe it. I believe it. Why, Stephen, do you believe this? Well, what makes them so sure of all this? Well, listen, James 1.17 says this, that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father above. Every good and perfect gift comes down. If there's something on earth that you like, it was already designed and prefabricated in heaven. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father above. Jesus was talking to those who were standing for truth in the face of adversity, and he said this in Luke chapter 6, verse 20. 23, he said, rejoice on that day and leap for joy for your reward in heaven is great, absolutely inexhaustible. You see, we've got this humanistic logic that is, expresses itself in this phrase. Most would prefer a known hell to an unknown heaven. You see, that's humanistic logic. That's earthly thinking, using low, earthly, finite thinking to understand heaven and its glory and its eternity only produces distorted ideas and lies. That's like a clay pot being asked to describe its maker, her motives, her inspiration. Heaven, God's home, holds the blueprints and data for all the created universe all of the created universe. Heaven has to be a ridiculous reward, blessing, a ridiculous, desirable, amazing place for God to be true and to hold on to his integrity. Oh, Philippians 3, verse 14. Listen to this. Paul said, I press on toward the goal to win the heavenly prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You see, you got to see it. you got to want it. You have to press towards something that doesn't call to you. You, you. How can you press towards something that doesn't call to you and excite you or energize you? It's got to be tangible, a prize, exciting, a reward. If you can't see it, my friend, you live life hopeless. You live me-centered in a fog without vision. Sadness is often caused by focusing inwardly, not outwardly toward others and not upwardly with vision. Sadness is often a focus problem, a navigation problem. You may have heard the story about a long distance swimmer. Her name was Florence Chadwick. And in 1952, she attempted the 26 mile swim between the California coastline and Catalina Island. During her swim, she had a team who kept an eye out for her for sharks. That's a good idea. And stayed ready in case she needed some help of some kind. About 15 hours into her swim, a thick fog obscured her vision. She couldn't see where she was going. She began to doubt herself, began to doubt her ability. She told her team that she didn't think she could make it. She swam for another hour before just giving up. Once she was in the boat, she looked toward her destination only to discover that she was just one mile from the shore of Catalina Island. Her lack of vision it caused her to give up, to surrender to the demands of the immediate, to just quit on herself. My friend, you're an eternal being. It's in your heart. It may be impossible for you to imagine, but you must try. 
I remember going through some of the castles in England and Scotland and marveling at the artwork, the furniture, the, the tools that dated back hundreds and hundreds of years. Pam and I were in Rome, Italy, and it was awe-inspiring to look at the great stones in the Colosseum that had been chiseled, shaped, even engraved thousands of years ago. What a sense of history and what a sense of the expanse of time. But think of it. You are an eternal being, and yet we often live life as though the next two minutes, the next two hours are more important than even the next 20 years. We've been seduced by the immediate. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1, For we know that if the earthly tent, our physical body, which is our house, is torn down through death, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. This doesn't mean that taking care of this earthly body isn't important. Of course it is. You're a steward of everything that God's entrusted to you. How you manage the little things qualifies you for overseeing the big things, right? How you invest the next few minutes qualifies you for the rewards in eternity. Heavenly assignments in paradise. But you've got to have a consciousness of heaven as part of your compass. Or how can you truly navigate the next few minutes? Another way of saying it is this. You must have eternity in your heart to live this life intentionally accurately. Otherwise, all of our measurements are off. That's why our hope and our peace are turned off. Ecclesiastes 3.11. He has made everything beautiful and appropriate in its time. He has also planted eternity, a sense of divine purpose in the human heart, a mysterious longing which, which nothing under the sun can satisfy except God. Yet man cannot find out, comprehend or grasp what God has done, God's overall plan from the beginning to the, to the end. God has planted eternity in your heart. It's part of your design. It's part of your purpose and your longing. It's part of your longing. Do you realize how microscopic 20 years would look on a scale beside a thousand years? And yet a person designed for eternity lives the next 20 hours, even 20 minutes, ruled by their appetite and base instinct. It's a futile way. It's not your design. And it produces hopelessness. So look at me with God's way, God's design, God's game plan. I love this picture. Genesis chapter 25, verses 7 and 8. It's about Abraham. He's come to the end of his time here on earth. And look at how the, the Word of God describes it. Verse 7, the days of Abraham's life were 175 years. Then Abraham's spirit was released and he died at a good, ample, full old age. An old man, I guess so, 175, right? An old man satisfied and satiated and was gathered to his people. Oh, did you hear that? Abraham was gathered to his people, not from his people, but to his people. Isaac, his son, was still on earth, but Abraham was going to more of his people than he was leaving his people. You might say, well, I'm only 18. Do I really need to be all that conscious of heaven? Yes, you do. You need the accurate vectors of where you're headed so that you can live accurately on life. You need to live right now with eternity in your heart. So you can live accurately, successfully, peacefully, and joyfully. When you have a loved one leave this world with Christ in their heart, you need to know they're still alive and more alive. You need to have that hope, a genuine living hope, not some fake entertainment industry illusion. Yes, heaven is real, says God. So how do we respond to such truth? How do we respond to this doctrine of heaven? Because we can't even pray the Lord's prayer without it. So let's go a little bit of King James old school from Matthew 6, starting at verse 9. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You see, we need our heavenly accounts satisfied, settled. And then verse 13, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Even the kingdom of God, the power and the glory are sourced out of heaven, all of life, all of love, joy, happiness is sourced out of heaven. 
This prayer draws our attention to the King of Heaven. Jesus is the true source of hope, but He's doing something and we should be aware of it, interested, fascinated, and say like Paul the Apostle, it's far, far better, far better. Now you're taking the lid off of life's potential. Now you're going someplace. You see, now death is swallowed up in victory, defeated and vanquished forever. So once again, how do we respond to such absolute truth? Yes, heaven is real. You simply respond by asking the King of heaven to come into your heart. Let Jesus establish your heavenly citizenship so you can start living with his benefits now as an envoy of another world. You get full rights of citizenship, diplomatic immunity from all earthly evil. That's a good thing right here, right now. Pray this with me. King Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of all my sins. You died on the cross for me. You rose up from the grave. I believe you reign. You conquered death, hell and the grave, so I can live for you. Heaven is my home. This world is my assignment to represent your name here on earth and to walk in your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, that's beautiful. Praise God. You are a child of His, a citizen of heaven with power and authority from Jesus to do His work on earth. Let us know how that we can be praying for you. And, and by going to the Jesus button on our website, you can let us know a little bit of your story. We want to get to know you. We have free life tools that you can access on our website, one of which is the Life Talks podcast. It's free, and it's where my wife Pam and I, we read the Bible to you, God's Word. We especially dig down the book of Proverbs, but there's other devotional, short ones, longer ones, and they'll help explain and lead you through prayers. And just, we do our best to help get God's Word and His encouragement and His covering in your life and your family. We want you to live life strong. 